worship. I am Pastor John, and uh, we're working to get our audio going. Can you hear me okay? No? Uh-oh. Testing one, two, testing one, two. Maybe go up a little higher. Okay. You know, uh, I think that's, I think we got it working now. All right, well, welcome to worship. I'm Pastor John, one of the pastors here at Palmdale United Methodist Church, where we are inspired to love. This is, a, this is a new day full of new beginnings. I'm excited for this service. We've got Deborah Reddish filling in on the keys today, and she's sounding beautiful. And I think you will just really enjoy this final uh, installment of our sermon series, New Beginnings. I invite you to hang tight. We'll be starting worship in just about five minutes.
Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. We're so glad that you're here. Those that are, that are here in the pews and those that have joined us online, welcome. This is the Palmdale United Methodist Church's live stream service. Uh, we're going to start our service off with hymn number 127, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Would you please stand and join us? with 383. This is the day of new beginnings. Since it's the last uh, Sunday for uh, the new beginnings sermon series. This is a seated. Would the children online, and if there's any in person, come forward this morning. You guys can sit right up here, so you got a good view of the screen. So when we first went into the pandemic and I started making uh, videos for the children's time, I would say, good morning, kids. And then sometimes now I say, good morning, kids. And then I say it again in the video. So I've made an executive decision. No more good morning, kids on the video. <laughs> Got to do it in person. So good morning, kids. Good morning, saints in the congregation. 
great to see you. Uh, I love stories and children's books, and I was gonna, I'm gonna read you about, I don't know, seven? Seven, so settle in, seven stories. You ready? All right, let's watch. Do you folks love stories? I love stories. I love collecting children's books and reading stories and telling stories. So I thought I would read a number of stories to you today. You ready? All right, here we go. All right, let's start with Yertle the Turtle by Dr. Seuss. You know, I have a lot of books that I want to read. So maybe we'll just, uh, instead of start at the beginning, let's just skip to the end. All right, here we go. And today, the great Yertle, that marvelous he, is king of the mud. That's all he can see. And the turtles, of course, all the turtles are free, as turtles and maybe all creatures should be. Here's a fun book called We Love You, Magoo. It's about a dog named Magoo. Now, let's uh, jump to the end. Silly doggo. We do love you. Oh, that's awesome. Ooh, here's one you probably haven't heard of. William's Doll by Charlotte Zolito. All right, let's see. He'll know how to take care of his baby and feed him and love him and bring him the things he wants like a doll so that he can practice being a father. The Prince, The Witch, The Thief, and The Bears by Alastair Chisholm. All right, flip into the back. And he kissed Jamie goodnight and left him to dream. Talk about old school, The Travels of Babar by Jean de Brunhoff. The back cover's got elephants on it and the book ends with this and after the ceremony babar celeste and the old lady sit and chat under the palm trees and what are we going to do next asks the old lady i am going to try and rule my kingdom wisely answers babar and if you will remain with us you can help me make my subjects happy the end all right let's do one more the little man of disneyland to this day, Patrick still keeps visits to Storybook Land a secret. So when you go to Disneyland and cruise the canals, keep your eyes open wide. Maybe you'll spot Patrick Bagora, the little man of Disneyland, enjoying the miniature wonders of his happy place. All right, so that was kind of weird, wasn't it? Like, why would we just read the end of the story? You miss all the beginning and the middle. It's a good point. I should have said spoiler alert, shouldn't I, at the beginning of that? Oh, well. You know, today, during uh, our worship service, later on, we're going to be reading the story that comes at the very end of the Bible, the last story. And God, oh, spoiler alert, God comes and creates a new heaven on earth. And all of God's children will gather together and God will be with us. And there'll be no more pain and crying and tears and illness and we all will live together in love and peace. That's how it ends. It's kind of neat. But you know what? We have an opportunity to live like that now, to take care of people, to love others, to be kind and go out of our way to help those in need. It may not be heaven on earth, but it can, it's probably what Jesus wants us to do. Let us pray. God, thank you for the great stories in life and the great stories from the Bible. And Thank you for letting us know that in the very end of everything, you will come to be with us and we'll all live together in love and peace. I pray your blessings upon all the children here and their families and help us to do the kinds of things you would want us to do, to treat others with love and kindness and respect, to love like Jesus loves. In his name we pray, amen. All right, see you next week. Wonderful day, thank you for coming. Blessings and we'll see you next week.
Thank you, Pastor Jim, for that. Testing one, two. Okay. All right. Um, and in the spirit of that time with children, I'm going to go ahead and give us the benediction, and we can be on our way. Uh, just kidding. Got a few announcements for us today. First of all, um, today is the Super Bowl, as I'm sure you know, and our youth ministry is putting on a Super Bowl party in the Fellowship Hall. It's at 3.30 p.m. It's for any kids in middle school or high school. Um, we had previously said you need to bring $5, but we actually had a generous donor who said that she wanted to cover the pizza, and so you don't need to bring anything. You can just bring yourself, uh, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Also today, right after church, at 1 p.m. is Lunch Church. Uh, this is a small group that is really just meant for connection and conversation, and uh, you can come even if you've never been before. It's at Primo Burgers at uh, 1 p.m., and it's the one on Palmdale Boulevard. Uh, so right after the, um, just, just a few hours, four hours from now. So uh, you can join that if you'd like. Uh, Pastor Jim leads the, the group, and they always have a wonderful time. Believe it or not, Lent is happening this week. It begins on Ash Wednesday, this coming Wednesday. Um, and uh, we're going to be doing an informal observance of Ash Wednesday. We'll do it during Food for Thought. Uh, we will be um, having a regular Food for Thought um, message, and then at the end we will do the imposing of the ashes. And throughout Lent, that we're going to be starting a new series for Food for Thought called Eating with Pixar. Uh, that will coincide with a new sermon series at the church next week called Eating with Jesus. Uh, we had a really a lot of fun with the short spirituality sermon, uh, series for Food for Thought that was going on, and so we decided to do some Pixar short films for round two, uh, this time focusing on the season of Lent and uh, stories from scripture that involve food uh, and meals and uh, that are related to the themes of Lent. That's happening every Wednesday uh, in the Fellowship Hall at 6 p.m., so we hope that you'll join us for Ash Wednesday this Wednesday. On February 25th, the missions team is going to be meeting. Um, you may or may not know about what our missions team is doing. Um, the pandemic kind of put a hold on some things. Uh, there were some people on our missions team that continued to do some things, like they would continue to serve um, a monthly meal, a free meal um, throughout uh, the pandemic. But we're kind of jump-starting this missions team and trying to get back to the full, robust feeling of what it's supposed to be. And so they have a meeting coming up on February 25th on, at 1230 that Sunday. And maybe you are interested in learning about the missions team. You don't know anything about them. Maybe you want to find out what PMC is doing in our community. Maybe you've got some ideas for how we can be serving the AZ. Uh, and maybe you're potentially interested in joining the missions team. Wherever you are on that spectrum, we enjoy, invite you to join us for the missions team meeting that Sunday. Finally, uh, Messy Church, the next one is coming that same Sunday, February 25th from 5 to 7 p.m. It's a wonderful time together. It's going to be themed, uh, the theme is love, since this is uh, Valentine's Day. Actually, this, is, this Wednesday is Valentine's Day, so since this month is about love, this one is going to be themed on love. We feed you a meal, we play games, we do skits, we have lots of activities, and it's for all ages, so we hope to see you there. As we move into a time of prayer, you're just scratching all over on the TV. Okay. All right. Um, just turn the Technical difficulties. All right. How's that? Okay. And anytime there's technical difficulty, I just think of like being at like Six Flags or an amusement park where a ride breaks down. You've already waited like an hour in line. And you're like, no, you're like five minutes from getting on the ride. Well, we are getting this thing figured out. And um, so let's, before we move into a time of prayer, let's highlight our churches from the North District that we'd be in partnership and prayer with. So that is Renew United Methodist, or United Methodist Mission and also Ojai United Methodist Church. Uh, you can be in prayers for their pastors, for their staff, for the ways that they're reaching their community, and for any ministries that they are really excited about this week. Uh, let's now go to God in a time of prayer. 
O Creator God who is making all things new, help us not to settle for any lesser vision of who we were made to be or what this world could be. Or it's true, occasionally we have lowered our expectations, given up on imagination, reluctantly subscribed to a version of life that isn't what we want, but still it's what we tell ourselves it's, that it's all we deserve. Or we've subscribed to a, vision, a version of life that's easier to come by. We're lost hope in anything better or simply all we've ever known. Yet today, we believe as we gather together today that this is the day of new beginnings. If anyone can challenge us to new heights, it's you, O oh God, the one who brought this whole universe into existence. With the psalmist, we pray, put a new song in our mouths. Give us hope. Inspire us. Help us to believe what we cannot yet see. And as we rejoice in your faithfulness and celebrate that you're doing something new in our lives and in our community, let it be an encouragement to others to reassure them that you truly are at work making all things new. As we lift up our hearts and our eyes to you this morning, believing that. We pray a prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As we move into our time of stewardship here, the, these verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 and 25. Do you not know that in a race the runners all compete, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win it. Athletes exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable garland, but we an imperishable one. So it is Super Bowl Sunday. Anybody excited about the game today? Yes? I'm a huge sports fan. Always love Super Bowls, even though... My team, the Cowboys, hasn't sniffed a Super Bowl in 28 years. <sighs> Let's have a moment of silence right now for all Cowboys fans. Uh, but congratulations to the Chiefs and the 49ers. We have any San Francisco fans today that are here? A few? Okay. Anybody cheering for Taylor's team? Sorry, the Chiefs. The Chiefs, yes. Uh, it should be a great game. Uh, I was looking for a Bible passage that would connect with the Super Bowl. I was thinking maybe David and Goliath, but then I realized there's no Davids. Like both San Francisco and Kansas City are like Goliaths. They're very talented teams, and many expected them to be here uh, before the season even started. And then I remembered this passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. It's a city in ancient Greece. And what's interesting is that in Corinth, they were known for the Ithsmian Games. And these games were held in between the Olympic Games in ancient Greece. Athletes would come from all over the Mediterranean to Corinth to compete. And so the people that lived there in Corinth, they knew a thing or two about athletes and competition. So Paul uses this imagery of competing in a running race, right, to encourage the early church to be focused on their discipleship. Right? And this was long, long before the uh, everyone gets a trophy uh, uh, era, right? Where only those that won or placed first, second, or third would win a prize for their efforts. And so Paul says we have to, uh, to, to live our faith as if we're competing for a prize. Now the prize, of course, is the kingdom of God, spending eternity, and to help bring about God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, right? And we'll hear more about that when we get to the message a little bit later. So how do we run the race of our discipleship? Well, when they asked Jesus that, he said, love God and love others, right? 
Those are the main things. Making time uh, starts with worship, with Bible reading, with prayer, um, with fellowship to connect with God, but also give ourselves away in love towards others, to love others the way we uh, love ourselves. And that's why we say here at Palmdale United Methodist Church, we're inspired by Jesus to love. We don't always get it right. Sometimes we fall short, but then we seek God's forgiveness and reconciliation, and we know God's grace is amazing and abundant. So this community of faith seeks to support, encourage, and walk alongside one another as we live out our faith and discipleships, and your financial gifts help make that possible. We say this every week, the easiest way to give is digitally through the church app. You can also text to give. Uh, there's a number right here, 833-641-6929. Follow the prompts. Put Palmdale UMC with no spaces in between on the text message, and you're good to go from there. We're also grateful for those that mail checks into the church. Thank you especially to those in our community that continue to connect with us online. And if you're here in church, uh, in the sanctuary, in person, and you're not giving digitally, we have offering boxes in the back of the sanctuary and in the lobby as well. It is a super day to live out our faith, to be followers of Jesus. No matter how the game ends up today, my hope and prayer is that all of our lives will be witnesses to God's amazing grace and love. So may we be focused and intentional as we live out our faith and exercise our discipleship and praise God for our teammates that run alongside with us along the way. Amen? Amen. I invite you to rise in body and or spirit as we uh, hear the, the scripture reading today from the book of Revelation by Ogbeniah Oke. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea was no more, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Here ends my reading. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated.
two uh, quick pieces of information for you. One, you notice our baptismal font is out. At our 11 o'clock service this morning, we are going to be celebrating the baptism of Marcelo Seguero. That, you may not recognize the name, but that is Ariana Pujols' son. And so Ariana and David and the family, including Sage, are all going to be here at the 11 o'clock service. So if you want to tune in at 11 and watch online or stick around if you're here uh, for the baptism, we'd love for you to celebrate uh, with us for that. And then secondly, many of you know um, uh, Bob and Letty McDaniel. They were part of our congregation for many years and then moved up to the, uh, is it Washington? Washington area. And then they stole Inga and Everett from us. No, they're, they're good friends and Inga and Everett went to, to be up with them. Um, Bob has uh, been sick for quite a while, and yesterday he moved from life to life. And so we mourn with Letty, but also we celebrate Bob's life. And uh, we will have an opportunity to, to, to remember and celebrate him in March uh, when uh, Letty and Inga and Everett come down for our next senior lunch on March 21st. Before the senior lunch at 1130, we're going to have a memorial service at 10 o'clock here in the sanctuary. And uh, so we'll give you more details later, but we'll have the opportunity to uh, praise God for Bob's life. In the meantime, if you'll be lifting up Letty and her extended family in prayers, I know they will appreciate it. Let us pray. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, do you recognize these two people? You may not be able to place their faces, but if you're a fan of children's books like I am, I know you'll be able to place their work. This is John Shezka and Lane Smith. They're renowned uh, children's book author and illustrator duo. They have a number of books that I love, including uh, The Stinky Cheese Man and Other Fairly Stupid Tales, which is a riot to read. Um, and... The Frog Prince continued. What happened after the uh, princess kissed the frog? Uh, but I wanted to share a portion of this book with you this morning. Squids Will Be Squids. Fresh Morals and Beastly Fables. Now, right after the table of contents, we have this serious historical foreword. Allow me to read it to you. <clears throat> Fables have been around for thousands of years, and it's no wonder, because even thousands of years ago, people were bright enough to figure out that you could gossip about anyone as long as you changed their name first to something like lion or mouse or donkey. Aesop is the guy most famous for these fables, though he wasn't the first nor the best looking. Most descriptions we have of Aesop call him funny-shaped or ugly or worse, but you didn't hear that from me. I think Aesop was one heck of a swell guy. <laughs> this book, Squids Will Be Squids, is a collection of fables that Aesop might have told if he were alive today and sitting in the back of class daydreaming and, and goofing around instead of paying attention and correcting his homework like he was supposed to because his dog ate it and he didn't have time to run out and buy a new paper and do it over again before his bus came and picked him up in the morning. These are beastly fables with fresh morals about all kinds of bossy, sneaky, funny, annoying, and dim bulb people. But nobody I know personally, really. <clears throat> Moral of the story, sometimes the names are changed to protect the not-so-innocent. Yeah. Well, welcome to the sixth and final edition of our New Beginnings sermon series. Now, if you're new to the series, we've been looking at a very, a various stories from the Bible that all deal with new opportunities and starting over, and I promise we'll connect back up with Squids Will Be Squids in just a moment. We began this series with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and today we finish with the very, one of the very last chapters in all of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21. Now, the book of Revelation falls into a category known as apocalyptic writings. Uh, Lori Shaw's husband, Rick, posted this on his Facebook page this last week. Uh, it says, this is a lunar eclipse, right? We know that occurs when the Earth positions itself directly between the sun and the moon, casting a shadow on the moon. 
This is a solar eclipse that happens when the moon passes between the earth and the sun, blocking all, all are part of the sun's light from reaching us on earth. And this is an apocalypse. <laughs> if the sun somehow gets between us and the moon, game over, right? Now, if you search the word apocalypse online, you're going to get pictures such as this, right? We've all seen those summer blockbuster movies with the, when the world comes to a dramatic and sudden end, right? Well, the Greek word apocalypsis, uh, which happens to be the uh, opening word in the book of Revelation, means to uncover or to disclose knowledge. Thus, the title of the book, Revelation, right? Apocalyptic literature is a literature that claims to have cosmic secrets and reveal them to a human recipient. Its purpose is to provide an alternative way of understanding the world, sort of a different worldview than what most people imagine. Mitchell Reddish, in his Smith and Hel Helvey's commentary on Revelation, tells us that apocalyptic thought first rose around the 6th century BC in Judaism. And it followed that time, we've talked about it uh, uh, during this series, the Babylonian exile, right? When Babylon came and destroyed uh, uh, Jerusalem and took the best and the brightest away, and they lived over 700 miles away for close to 70 years. Well, in light of that, apocalyptic uh, thought and, and literature started to come about, and it had a tremendous impact on the New Testament and on Christianity. In fact, he writes... The ideas of a final judgment, resurrection, future rewards and punishments, destruction of the forces of evil, conflicts between good and evil forces, angels, demons, all of these are ideas that came up during this apocalyptic thought. Now, apocalyptic literature is highly symbolic, and they are written, uh, oftentimes are written in times of persecution and difficulty. Reverend Ann Robinson, in uh, her series Exploring the Bible, notes that this is why apocalyptic writings are often so confusing, because they're written in an elaborate code. Now, back to the uh, opening book I was reading. Remember how Aesop changed the names of people he was writing about to donkey, lion, or mouse, right, to, to make sure that he didn't get in trouble writing about it? Well, the same principle applies with apocalyptic literature. The early church was being persecuted by the Roman Empire, but they couldn't outwardly say how horrible the Roman Empire is because that would involve more persecution. So when you, name, when you see the name Babylon in uh, the book of Revelation, think Roman Empire. That's actually one of the few code words that we are able to decipher from the book. Most of the symbols in Revelation Biblical scholars do not know what it was referring to. So be careful when you read Revelation, especially if you think you know what modern-day parallels that are happening now uh, connect with what was written in the book. Dr. Reddish writes, Sometimes, uh, oops, well, I guess I missed the quote. Here's what it says. Sometimes severe, uh, sincere but misguided readers have distorted John's message by turning it into a sensationalist game of match the prediction, in which events happening today are understood as literal fulfillment events, supposedly foretold in detail by the author of Revelation. Most biblical scholars will tell you that's not why Revelation was written. It was written, like most apoc apocalyptic literature was, to provide hope and comfort and courage to those who are dealing with intense difficulties, and problems. It was a call to be faithful no matter what your circumstances might be. This is Dr. M. Eugene Boring and his interpretation commentary on Revelation. He has a very uh, helpful, but he calls it oversimplistic, overview of the Bible. And this kind of gives us a, a sense of how Revelation comes into play. It says, at the beginning, we have creation, right? The book of Genesis that tells us that God created all things. Then from the books of Exodus to Malachi, we have the covenant. And this shows that when creation was spoiled by a rebellious humanity, God created a people, Israel, to be his agents, witnesses, and bearers of the promise of God's salvation, which would come. 
Then, through the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we have the Christ period, right? It reveals how God himself came to earth and the person of his son, the Messiah, to bring salvation and reconciliation. And then the books Acts through Jude talk about the church, and this conveys how God continued Israel's mission in the church by creating an inclusive community from all nations to be witnesses and agents to God's saving act that uh, was already uh, being accomplished for the people. And then we get the consummation, the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. This is where God brings history to a worthy conclusion uh, when the creation which belongs to God's kingdom will become, as Revelation eleven fifteen says, the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And we hear Handel's Messiah in the background, right, as that music, as those words are written. Now, the book of Revelation was penned at the end of the first century CE, here on that island of Patmos. Now, Patmos is located in the Aegean Sea, east of Greece, west of what was called Asia Minor at that time. And the author was a man named John. Now, we don't know much about the author of the book of Revelation. It was not the disciple of Jesus, because it was many, many, many years after that. And most scholars believe it was not uh, either the author of the gospel of John. Biblical scholar Brian K. Blount in his New Testament library commentary on Revelation says this. Revelation is a mean book. It is... Not, however, mean-spirited. John's meanness is the effect of a sure cause. It derives from the anger he feels about the injustices that have been imposed upon him and his people. And the even greater injustices that he is sure will soon arise if his people live out their faith in the way that he hopes that they will. So, without further delay, we're going to jump into our final New Beginnings passage for today it comes at the very end of the book of Revelation. Most of the mean parts, according to Dr. Blount, have already been passed uh, by this time in the book. And John is writing about what the end of time will be like. Now, keep in mind, as Dr. Boring puts it, that human uh, language is really incapable of expressing, just like our human imagination is incapable of perceiving uh, the reality of things in the eternal world. So John is just trying to do the best he can to use uh, human images and metaphors to explain something that we really won't understand until we actually get there ourselves. Revelation 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. Now, it's interesting today, right? When people talk about spending eternity with God, the phrase they say is going to heaven, right? Don't you want to, I, I want to go to heaven. Uh, well, we're about to see that at least according to the book of Revelation, no one actually goes to heaven at the end of, the, uh, of time. Uh, a new heaven comes to us. And this is actually a fulfillment from Isaiah 65, 16 and 17, where the prophet wrote, for I'm about to create a new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I'm about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. Now this was written at a time, we're going back to the Babylonian exile. Uh, Isaiah was a prophet around this time. The, the, the people of Israel, were their, their dreams and hopes were crushed when the Babylonian superpower army came in and destroyed everything. But our God that we serve specializes in divine recycling. And God is able to take the pain, the disappointment, the destruction that often occurs in life and reworks it into something new. And so that's what's going to take place at the end, says John in Revelation 21. At the end of everything, a new heaven and a new earth. Now, quick mention of the sea uh, here being no more. In the Hebrew Bible, the sea represented chaos and rebellion. It was that untamed part of creation. In fact, in ancient Israelite mythology, the sea was home to Leviathan, which is sort of this uh, mythic sea monster that represents chaos. And earlier in the book of Revelation, the sea was where the dragon, the evil dragon, rose up uh, to, to fight against humankind. Now in chapter 21, all of that is gone. All of the evil has been removed. Verse 2. 
And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So what is this new heaven on earth going to be like? John says, well, it's going to be like a city. It's going to be like a city, a renewed Jerusalem. Jerusalem, of course, being that place in the Hebrew Bible, God's special city where God dwells with his people because the temple was present there, built in the city of Jerusalem. As Dr. Reddish puts it, the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven from God. It is not simply a rebuilt Jerusalem, a renovated and repaired former system. No, this is a new Jerusalem located on the new earth. God has transformed the old into something new. So this world that God created and in the beginning that God declared as good is now redeemed and renewed. And contrary to some popular beliefs, there is no concept of the rapture in the book of Revelation. According to John's revelation, believers won't be taking up taken up into heaven at this time. No, heaven will be lowered down. God's city will be lowered down into a transformed earth. You might have even heard the expression among Christians, oh, this world is not my home, right? With this Im Im implying, of course, that, that heaven is where we belong, right? To be with God for all eternity. But if we're looking at uh, John's revelation, then at the end of the Bible, it says this world, no, this world is our home. It's, it's not the place that we're trying to escape from, for we will continue to dwell here on earth, but it will be a renewed earth as God changes things. And then John tells us that this new Jerusalem, as it comes down, will be prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So John uses marriage, a marriage metaphor to describe that close and intimate relationship that God will have with us, his people. Reverend Blount also notes here, and again in chapter 22, verse 17, these are the only uh, uses of the word bride in early Christian literature. And it's talking about that intimacy we have with God. Verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. So in the former city of Jerusalem, God dwelt with the people in the temple. That the temple was understood to be God's home on earth. John tells us, not in the new Jerusalem, not in the new heaven and earth that God is creating. There is no holy temple because the whole city is holy. God's home is with us, among us, Emmanuel. In fact, at the end of chapter 21, John tells us this in verse 22. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. So in the end, we meet not an event or a place, but we meet a person. That God is come to dwell with us. And as Dr. Boring says, God does not merely bring the end, but God is the end. And then John gives us that, uh, that eternal, the news that eternal comfort will have no crying no pain, no tears, no mourning, no death ever again. And just as evil has already been eliminated from this new heaven and earth, so too is everything that creates suffering and death. There is no place for it here. Anything that currently robs life from being fulfilling and joyful and vibrant will not be found in the New Jerusalem. Now, these verses should put an end to those well-meaning but ultimately not helpful platitudes that many Christians repeat. Things like, you know, God never gives us more than we can handle. Or, uh, it must be God's will. You don't have to understand it. You just have to, to trust it. Or my least personal favorite, you've heard me rail on this before, everything happens for a reason. Nope, according to Revelation 21, 3 and 4, it is not God's will that pain and suffering and crying are, are, are happening in our lives. In fact, that's simply a part of being frail and sinful humans. The fact is that God's will is to eliminate uh, all of that when his kingdom comes to perfect fruition. Verse 5. And the one who was seated on the throne said, did I get the right verse? Yep. See, I am making all things new. And he said, write these words for they are trustworthy and true. Nope, I don't have the right verse. There we are. 
And, I will, and write these words for they are trustworthy or true. I love it how God isn't into, make, isn't into making all new things, but God makes all things new. Right? God is the ultimate recycler. Paul knew this truth when he wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Verses 6 and 7. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift uh, from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things. I will be their God and they will be my children. I think this is another significant, there, or there was another significant moment in the Bible when the words, it is done, was spoken. In fact, the exact words were, it is finished. Jesus spoke these words from the cross at the very end of his earthly life. Everything had been accomplished through his life of sacrificial love. And then with that, the chains of sin and death were broken once and for all. And now, here at the end of all, God once again says... It is finished. It is done. For God is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters in the Greek alphabet. So God is the first of all things and the last of all things. In, in the beginning was God, and here at the end, God remains. And God is with us for all eternity, and we are God's beloved children. Now, this is just the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, about the new beginnings that we will all have at the end of time with God. I uh, give you homework again. I mean, the game doesn't start till 3.30. So when you get home, you got a little bit of time. You can finish reading chapter 21 and maybe chapter 22. Uh, it's definitely worth your time. But when we started this series, right, on the first Sunday of 2024, we were here in the Garden of Eden. And Pastor John was leading us through that first Genesis story. Uh, actually, in, in Genesis 1, we we're told that God created everything and it was good. And then Pastor John was leading us through the second creation story in Genesis 2 and 3, where we're told about the Garden of Eden and man and woman, Adam and Eve, that were created to be in intimacy together. And then how sin entered the picture and everything changed. But now here at the end, we are... In this new Jerusalem, this new city, and intimacy with God has been restored. God's kingdom is fully manifest. But let me share this, and I hope you're able to hear it. This new creation isn't simply something for us to look forward to. Christopher Rowland, in his New Interpreter's Bible Commentary on Revelation, writes this. In Christ, there is already the possibility and the power of God's Spirit to bring about that new creation in individual lives, though with the clear recognition of the struggle of the birth pangs of the whole creation that must undergo before paradise can be revealed. Human agents infused with the Spirit, we talked about that last week on the Pentecost story, human agents infused with the Spirit of the new creation may contribute to that future reign of God here and now in the midst of the debris of the old world. So all that to say, this isn't just a nice story that wraps up the end of this series. It's not just something that we say, well, when, when we die, we will be there at the end. No, this is an assignment for us. This is an opportunity. This is an ultimate new beginning. Jesus, when he came, spoke about the kingdom of God. He said that it was both a present and future reality. Present, he said, the kingdom of God is among us. And in Jesus' life and ministry and death, we saw signs of God's kingdom, the way that God wanted this world to be uh, structured and how we related to one another. That started to take place. But we're not there yet, right? And so we have the future part of, as we're reading in Revelation 21, this is what will happen at the very end. But we're here in the present, and we have an opportunity to help bring about God's vision for humankind on earth. Dr. Boring puts it this way, if this is where the world under the sovereign grace of God is finally going, meaning Revelation 21, then every thought, move, and deed in some other direction by us today is out of step with reality and finally wasted. In the world of psychology, there's something known as cognitive 
dissidence, right? This is understanding that often there's discord between uh, the reality that we live in and the, the ideal of the way it should be. And so most people, when they encounter cognitive dissidence, they, they usually choose to look away from the ideal and just sort of accept what the reality is right now and, and avoid the evidence filtering the data, sort of minimizing, so it doesn't seem to be as bad as it actually is. But through the life of Jesus, we know that a big part of living faithfully is loving God and loving others. Jesus came with this life-giving message of love, which sought to break down walls and barriers and prejudices that we humans often put up between ourselves and others. Shortly after I arrived here at as pastor of this church 10 years ago, I had a chance to go to a conference. I think it was a, a bishop's conference in Southern California, and we were gathering out in Palm Springs, and in one of the main sessions, they challenged us to write down a vision that we had for our church. Now, I was new here, only been here for about a year, and I was just beginning to get a sense of who we are as a people and where maybe God was leading. And so I took out a napkin that I had from my lunch, and I wrote down this vision, and then I tucked it into the front of my Bible. And I took it out again, not for the first time, but it had been a while since I took it out this week. And here's what it says. That the faith community of Palmdale United Methodist will be a tangible reflection of the kingdom of God in the Antelope Valley and beyond, by love freely shared, lives being transformed, and that we give ourselves away for others. That's the big dream that I felt God was leading us uh, close to a decade ago. Have we achieved that? Not completely. We are, however, seeking to become more and more like Jesus each and every day as we deepen our commitment as disciples being inspired by Jesus to love. And so this is our new beginning, friends. We know where this earth This world is headed, right, to a renewed heaven and earth, a new Jerusalem, where all people are loved and valued and accepted, where evil and justice and oppression has no place whatsoever, where God's forgiveness and grace will reign supreme. We're not there yet, but instead of just waiting until we die to experience it, we should be working towards that here and now. Do not settle for the way things are. Don't Uh, minimize the cognitive cognitive dissidence that we know through the life and death of Jesus of what things should be like. Let us work towards bringing about the kingdom of God here on earth as Jesus taught us and as is revealed in the scriptures. This is our new beginning, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to rise as we finish our, uh, our service and the series with a classic uh, song about the end of all time, Marching to Zion, number 733.
beautiful city of God. We don't know exactly what this new heaven and earth will be like. John did his best to, uh, to convey uh, human connections to these earthly re or heavenly realities. Uh, but we know, according to Revelation, that God will be with us, that it will be a community where we are um, dwelling together. I love it how uh, it talks about the, the gates of the city will be wide open, that, that there is uh, inclus in inclusive opportunity for all. May our lives be wide open this week as we share God's love with others, that others may come to know that they are not left out, they are not cast off, they are not forgotten, that they are included in part of the grand picture of God's plan for this world. Go in peace to live out the kingdom of God now and forever. Amen. Dear God, our hearts are broken for this world. The hatred is palpable, the division undeniable, and the pain runs deep. We desperately need more of you. We ask for your truth to be louder than the noise which surrounds us. For your mercy to be stronger than the voices of oppression for your strength to overpower those who seek to do harm. Where there is division, bring unity. Where there is anger, bring peace. Where there is evil, bring victory. Empower us to fulfill your mission, to answer your calling, to be the light you've created us to be. May your love your grace and your mercy flood this world. We love you. We seek you. We place our hope in the mighty name of Jesus. This we pray. <laughs>